Thanks, Angela. And thank you so many of you for being here. It's great to see people from all around the world, in addition to coast and see a lot of familiar faces. So um, it's, it's a pleasure to be able to have the chance to talk with you uh, about some of my work today. Um, and before I begin with talking specifically about refugee resettlement rhetoric in Minnesota, I want to um, just give you a little background on how this project came to be, because that's an interesting story in and of itself. Um, so it started back in uh, spring of 2018, or actually fall of 2018, uh, there was a grant opportunity made possible by the Council of Independent Colleges and the, and the Andrew Mellon Foundation. And that grant was called Humanities Research for the Public Good. Um, what that meant was, hey, they said, look, we need to both sort of celebrate and support humanities research and also think about how that kind of research really can inform public conversations. Um, and so I was excited to be able to think about how, um, uh, how I could develop a project uh, that would fit within that initiative. The, the grant required three key things, three key components. One, you had to use a library or archive collection from your home institution, right? So from Gustavus. Um, you had to have a community partnership that could help you think about how you would actually put the research into the public realm. And it had to include undergraduate students in the research process. So those three components were both com all compelling to me, but also put together a really collaborative project. Um, and so I want to make sure, and at the end, I will try to name just a handful of the people that have been involved in this project um, from its beginning, um, but I'll also speak specifically to the student involvement. Um, and then, of course, another part of the component of this grant, um, it was a $10,000 and um, was that you had to do a public presentation of that research um, in some form. So in the fall of 2019, after I'd received a grant, I taught a class on the rhetorics of immigration. And the reason that we came the topic um, is because uh, in our archive here at Gustavus, we have the Lutheran Church archive materials. And one box uh, in that collection is um, a series of papers from the Lutheran Resettlement Service centered around this period of time that I'll be talking about today, 1948 to 1952, post-World War II, helping to resettle refugees uh, from Europe uh, into the United States. As a part of a class that I taught, um, I, these, most of these students, not all, were in that class, and uh, they were part of the process of examining the papers in the archive, looking at the discourse, right, because I'm a communication studies professor, thinking about the language and the rhetoric that's used, um, and what could we learn from this period of time. Um, and so the students really dug in, and one of the things that really excited them was this public presentation of the research. Uh, in addition, we ended up going to the Minnesota Historical Society and also the, the Immigration History Research Archives in Minnesota at the University of Minnesota to help supplement some of the materials we had here in our archive. But that public presentation component was really important to these students. Um, it, it raised the stakes for their research a little bit. It wasn't they were going to just write a paper. They were also going to have to put what they discovered and what they were analyzing into the public space. Um, we conceived of and developed um, an exhibit for public presentation that was going to go up in May of 2020. As you imagine, it did not happen in May of 2020, but it is up now. <laughs> so if you do happen to be in St. Peter, it's going to be up at the Treaty Site History Center here in St. Peter, Minnesota, which is uh, managed by the Nicolette County Historical Society. And that's um, right on 169 as you come into St. Peter from the north. Uh, and you can see a picture of, of some of the posters that are in that exhibit and some of the materials. So it's been a really inspiring project and some of the students have even come back to be able to see the exhibit that they initially started working on back in fall of 2019. Uh, in addition, I did note on this one slide, Kira Bauer also worked with me one summer on a presidential um, research uh, faculty student research collaboration grant that Gustavus makes possible. So we worked one summer to further analyze the research and, and build um, pre presentation for academic conferences and publications. So it's truly been a collaborative effort um, and I'm really excited to be able to share some of the work that the students um, developed and the, some of the material I'll read from uh, today or share with you. Um, Kira was uh, also instrumental in putting together so I want to make sure she uh, gets a shout out for that. 
1947, nearly a million European residents uh, or Europeans resided in displaced persons camps in Austria, Germany, or Italy, unable to return their, to their homelands after World War II ended. That same year, anticipating an influx of immigration stemming from this humanitarian crisis, Minnesota Governor Luther Youngdahl called on his constituents to support resettlement of these refugees, declaring, we in this state are the second and third generation pioneers of the upper Midwest, and we can understand and feel a kinship for these pioneers, the delayed pilgrims of the 20th century. Within a year, the United States passed federal legislation to admit 200,000 displaced persons to the United States. Now that 1948 Displaced Persons Act legislation may have made immigration possible, but it didn't make it easy. It relied on two key mechanisms. One, states had to organize a process for resettling displaced persons within their borders, and American individuals or organizations had to guarantee housing and work for any displaced person they sponsored. The resettlement advocacy campaign in Minnesota offers insight into how one state government working closely with religious agencies conscripted Americans as participants in the resettlement process. Students and I examined public advocacy materials, including brochures, radio broadcasts, and advertisements that advocated for Minnesotans to open up their homes and workplaces to European immigrants. What stood out to us were the ways that displaced persons were described. The advocacy materials focused on what a displaced person, what made the displaced persons a good fit for Minnesota and characterized them as good neighbors and good workers. So to understand why this discourse was so important, I'll first describe some of the historical context for resettlement. And then I'll discuss the themes that show up in the resettlement materials and how, and show you some examples of how displaced persons were characterized in order to encourage people and organizations to sponsor them. And at the end, because this is uh, an alumni college um, presentation, I also will talk a little bit about Gustavus's participation in the Displaced Persons Resettlement Program uh, during that period of time. So in 1945, uh, more than 10 million people had been displaced by the war from their homes around Europe, including Russian prisoners of war, Jews fleeing, Jews fleeing prosecution, concentration camp survivors, forced laborers from Axis occupied countries, displaced Germans, and people from Baltic states fleeing Soviet occupation. The United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration spearheaded the effort to repatriate over 8 million people back to their homelands, but not all displaced persons were welcomed in their home country or felt safe to return. After five months, nearly 1 million refugees remained, most of whom resided in allied management, ally managed uh, displaced persons assembly centers, known colloquially as DP camps. Eastern Europeans in particular, including Catholic Lithuanians, Protestant Latvians, and Estonians, found the return home impossible as the USSR invaded and occupied their countries. Of the group seeking resettlement in the United States, in addition to the Jewish refugees, the majority were Eastern European, originating from Poland, the Baltic states, and Yugoslavia. Over 70% of displaced persons admitted to the United States between 1945 and 1952 came from countries that were then occupied by the Soviet Union. Implementation in the United States of the Displaced Persons Act required public participation, not just public agreement. Resettlement depended on Americans' willingness to sponsor, house, and employ displaced persons. In order for any displaced person to even be considered for resettlement in the United States, an affidavit of support, similar to what you, um, you see here, this is an example of a form that someone uh, filled out indicating their willingness to serve as a sponsor. This was Harry Hansen, who was a farmer here in St. Peter. Uh, they had to fill out an affidavit of support demonstrating that they could provide housing and they could provide work. Um, and then, uh, and they also had to assure, right, that the, the new, uh, the arriving displaced person would not become quote unquote a public charge, right? So they were really wanted to make sure that the state would not become responsible financially uh, for any refugees that were arriving in the United States. With the help of state-run commissions, voluntary groups, and religious organizations, a publicity campaign for DP resettlement advocated for supporting displaced persons. The Displaced Persons Commission continually emphasized that, quote, 
The Displaced Persons Program was the American people's own program in a very personal sense, since the American people took these new Americans into their homes and communities, unquote. Now, inviting participation wasn't straightforward. America's isolationist stance toward immigration in preceding decades drove the need to persuade Americans who were disposed to be gen dis generous to DPs, but were fearful of the economic and social impact they might have if admitted. Immigration legislation in the 1920s was defined by closed door policies that allowed only immigrants of certain ethno-national backgrounds and placed restrictive quotas on those groups deemed, quote, worthy of admission and capable of becoming American. Southern and Eastern Europeans in particular were seen as unable to, quote, transcend their ethnic identities, unquote, when entering American society. And in the 1920s, restrictionists believed that if these groups were allowed to enter, American democracy could not be sustained. Uh, and this form is another example of a, the, an assurance right against the public charge, a letter that would be signed, sort of an affidavit from uh, a sponsor. And this 1938 survey um, provides a poll, just a sort of a pre-World War II glimpse at American attitudes towards uh, immigration and resettlement. Um, uh, so they were, you know, folks were asked, what is your attitude towards German, Austrian, and other political refugees coming to the US? 67% uh, said, with conditions as they are, we should try to keep them out. Now, of course, this is one point in time, this is 1938, right? But it is reflective of some of the, um, you know, attitudes that a, a, an advocacy campaign around resettlement would need to navigate in order to make the case for people to um, sponsor uh, immigrants. In Minnesota in particular, um, uh, we were experiencing a shortage of labor following World War II. Agriculture, uh, in particular, a major industry here in Minnesota, lacked the labor force necessary to produce at full capacity in post-World War II economy. Thousands of farmers um, across the state were worried because their farms were empty uh, and some were leaving uh, the farmland altogether because it was too difficult to maintain. So this need for help um, led to um, you know, uh, a campaign sort of focusing a lot also on the labor that displaced persons could provide. Minnesota was noteworthy um, among states in the United States for its displaced persons resettlement infrastructure. Uh, under the leadership of Governor Luther Youngdahl, Minnesota took steps to ensure that displaced person resettlement within its borders um, prior to the, even the passage of Displaced Persons Act uh, in 1948. In other words, Minnesota was ready to go as soon as that legislation passed because they had started to network and work with a variety of agencies, primarily religious organizations around the state in order to set up an infrastructure and a plan for being able to uh, support and resettle refugees. Ever public about his faith, uh, Governor Youngdahl promoted a strong, quote, Christian conscience, and his close relationship with religious organizations became beneficial in calling upon the people of Minnesota to take action in resettling displaced persons. Uh, they also circulated uh, a survey around the state uh, to over 100,000 people uh, through clergy to find out what would be our capacity right, for sponsoring uh, and resettling displaced persons. Uh, and they, they learned that it would be about 2,000 based on that initial survey. Uh, but by 1952, they had resettled in Minnesota over 6,000, close to 7,000 refugees um, in Minnesota. Uh, Luther Youngdahl in particular in 1950, uh, right, emphasized this as democratic work. Uh, so this was something that he was very supportive throughout um, his governorship and uh, writes, quote, is that he said to us in Minnesota, displaced persons program has become an outstanding example of teamwork for democracy. Um, and the cartoon there is from uh, a newspaper in Minnesota um, that sort of stressed again, trying to uh, frame displaced persons as uh, not a threat, but actually as central to um, democratic advancing democracy in the United States. Uh, so let's see, uh, some, you know, someone had sent in a question before the talk today about numbers. So I wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of numbers as reported by the Lutheran Resettlement Service. So one of the, Luth one of the religious agencies that was involved in resettlement was the Lutheran Resettlement Service. 
um, of which we have the records here at Gustavus. Um, in those reports, you can see some of the statistics that they tracked over, um, over time. So in 1952, which is the end of the program, right, the Lutheran Resettlement Service, Service itself recorded that they had resettled 1,800 people or 1,822 people uh, in Minnesota, so had come through um, their network. Many of those were in, and the majority were in uh, rural communities like St. Peter. Um, and statewide, to put that in perspective, this report from 1951, somebody actually wrote on this report and handwriting, it was like, oh, 530. 331 is not accurate, it's actually closer to 6,000. And as I said, by the end of, of um, the Displaced Persons Act in 1952, they had resettled close to 7,000 people in Minnesota. Uh, and nationwide, uh, to put it in a little bit of perspective, um, 1950, so halfway through this period of time, about 160,000 people had been resettled in the United States. And by the end, that number was about double. Um, so by 1952, uh, there were between three and 400,000 people settled uh, across the US. <clears throat> and some additional data from those reports, which are fascinating to read in their entirety, but I didn't want to make a million slides about data because I mostly am a discourse analyst, not a data analyst. But to give you a sense of the, uh, this again, the sense of um, how many people were resettled more in rural communities versus urban uh, communities, because that emphasis on agriculture and that St. Peter for Lutheran Resettlement Service was right one of the top three cities for resettling um, across the state. Uh, so Northfield, St. Peter, and Owatonna were the top three. Um, and you can also see sort of a breakdown by church affiliation. Um, and this is throughout the state. Um, the number around, this is in 1950. Again, I don't have reports for every year, so that's why this data isn't complete. Um, but, you know, about two years into the program, um, about 1,100 1, um, Lutheran families had, from, had, had resettled in the area. So importantly, though, uh, not everything was good news um, <laughs> in terms of resettlement. So um, because of the overwhelming number of agricultural laborers needed in the Midwest, displaced persons often had little choice but to um, relocate to farms. So um, they might have received some orientation in the, in the displaced persons camps in Europe um, about what to expect from American life. And you know, the displaced person sponsors received some explanation about how best to accommodate right, the displaced persons uh, in, in their communities. But these kind of orientations were not entirely successful at avoiding conflict. Right? So some sponsors misunderstood contract agreements and the extent to which displaced persons would actually be skilled in agricultural labor, right? So someone might show up to work on your farm and then um, you discover that maybe they don't actually have the skill set that you need. So that led to some conflict and frustrations. Similarly, displaced persons would arrive and uh, settle on a farm and maybe living in a chicken coop without um, much insulation or a place, right, to lay their head and they were a family of four. So sometimes the accommodations were pretty difficult or perhaps were also not treated um, as neighbors or as friends, but rather as labor um, in ways that were complicated. So um, some of the bad experiences um, also prom prompted um, organizations like Lutheran Resettlement Service to be a little bit more responsive and to try to be more involved in sort of following up with host locations and supporting the both the displaced persons and the sponsors. Um, but it was a complicated uh, history. So I wanna make sure we're not also, um, uh, we can celebrate both the infrastructure and the value of Minnesota's resettlement, but also recognize the complexity of the actual day-to-day -day, um, experience that people had. So the post-World War II refugee resettlement campaign that we analyzed includes pamphlets, radio advertisements, and newspaper articles produced by the National and Minnesota Displaced Persons Commissions, the Church World Service, and local Minnesota re refugee resettlement agencies. These texts distributed throughout Minnesota provide a lens into the local uh, resettlement process and the discourse that enabled it. The publicity campaign focused on portraying displaced persons as good, Christian, anti-communist Europeans fleeing the wrath of the Germans and the looming oppression of the Soviet Union. Baltic refugees were also given special consideration because many were quote, skilled agricultural and forestry workers, a demographic highly desired 
um, in this part of the world at that time. So displaced persons, the label itself um, was ubiquitous, right? That was typically how um, the refugees were framed and referred to. From newspaper headlines to advocacy pamphlets to government reports, displaced persons was a commonplace label for European refugee, refugees that denoted, quote, anyone forced by Nazis or fascists to leave his country to work for the German war effort in World War II or anyone deported and held away from home for religious, racial, or political reasons. In addition to the displaced adjective functioning as an accurate depiction of refugee circumstances, it also carried a rhetorical value for resettlement advocacy. The term foregrounded the contingent experience of European refugees, deassociating the refugees from any particular ideology, place, or culture. Resettlement advocates focused on DPs statelessness and homelessness, effectively erasing the refugees' nationality from the advocacy narrative. Ambiguity around their national origins enabled advocates to emphasize displaced persons as just like us and as possessing the qualities celebrated in the lore of Minnesota pioneers, hardworking and skilled, but in need of a place to put their talents to work. So one prominent um, uh, metaphor used was the idea of neighbor, displaced persons as neighbors. Featured in documents addressed to both displaced persons and their prospective hosts, neighbor explicitly foregrounded the similarities between displaced persons and their Minnesota sponsors. The L Lutheran Resettlement Service demonstrates a prime example of this in their pamphlet called On Being Good Neighbors, New Neighbors, New Friends. In this handout distributed to Lutheran congregations throughout Minnesota, LRS, the Lutheran Resettlement Service, characterized displaced persons as only, quote, as different from each other as the people living on your block or as the people who attended Sunday services are different from you. Radio advertisements similarly upheld that displaced persons were possess, uh, possessed, quote, warm heartedness and neighborly characteristics of the American people, unquote. This discourse of sameness argued that displaced persons would arrive with the shared traits, including religious affiliations, and skipped over potentially the arduous process of integrating people of different backgrounds, cultures, and languages into their communities. The term neighbor suggested affability and relatability with differences only in small traditions or daily routines, but not in values or culture. Neighbor rhetorically locates displaced persons in proximity to Minnesotans in a non-threatening way, imagining displaced persons as having already assimilated into Minnesota cultural norms regardless of how disparate cultural norms may be across the state of Minnesota alone. Uh, neighborhood articulates, neighbor articulates sameness without offering specificity about what is the same. Like any good narrative, this ambiguity invites the audience to identify with the other and write onto them their own values, beliefs, and stories about how their specific relationship will unfold. By constituting displaced persons as possessing non-specific values that align with those of Minnesotans, the advocacy materials dampened Minnesotans' anxieties about the displaced persons' integration uh, into their communities, reducing the perception of any potential adjustment or discomfort that one would have to navigate um, in a changing neighborhood. Another prominent frame was uh, displaced persons as assets or laborers. The identification with displaced persons was further secured through this shared civic virtue agricultural skills and work ethic. In local newspapers, headlines proclaimed DPs proposed as labor source for state farms, which would quote, solve a serious employment problem for farmers. DPs were framed as an invaluable resource to Minnesotan farms experiencing a labor shortage as a result of the war. Not only were they suitable to become Minnesotans, but they would also stimulate the state's economy. Arguments centered around the idea that displaced persons themselves would be a net gain for the US. Uh, one newspaper article was quoted as saying, the country stands on the whole to gain more than it loses from European refugees. Commoditized for the benefit of US and local economies, displaced persons were depicted as, quote, job makers, not job seekers. In this way, they were imagined as uniquely helpful for the US economy in direct refutation of concerns that they would take jobs from Americans. By establishing the usefulness of DPs, resettlement rhetoric 
welcomed them for their contributions to the advancement of the economy. The Church World Service entered this conversation stating directly that uh, displaced persons are an asset. They've undertaken many steps to enable themselves to fit better into their new homes. They have devoted much of their camp time to studying language and vocational and specialized training. Many have supplemented old skills with uh, new ones and quote, they will make splendid citizens. Defining DPs as an asset constituted their identity in terms of their utility for their new country as one newspaper described them, useful citizens. Continuously, rhetoric highlighted the economic benefit that TPs would bring to the country. They need us, but we need them too. Their skills, their devotion to democracy, won through hardship and suffering, their labor and their Christian leadership are all assets we can use. In a consumerist economy, value is emphasized. Displaced persons were described as, quote, a good buy and a good bargain. Uh, displaced persons were further monetized Quote, if we act soon enough, we can probably get the cream of most of these groups, unquote. Resettlement advoca advocates in arguing that DPs um, were a good return on investment for the American economy, um, they said, right, refugees coming is a sound financial investment. Uh, it won't cost us uh, too much to, to bring them over. And in fact, uh, it will um, actually stimulate the economy. The rhetoric articulated re resettlement as an exchange. DPs, DPs were given a place to live, employment and security, and Americans received new laborers for their economy. So these, this, this is a point in class where I would say, now let's talk a little bit about how these things are framed and what are some of the implications, right, of, of identifying displaced persons in these kind of prominent frames, right, both kind of a moral argument that they are, you know, just like us and they're going to be able to settle into our communities and, and we'll all be, um, you know, uh, singing camp songs around the fire and also, uh, you know, an economic argument, right, that they're able to support and advance the economy. Um, right, these were really prominent frames that responded fittingly to the, the context, right, to help um, make a case for resettlement. But I think it's also important, right, and we've talked about um, extensively with students, like what are some of the broader implications of this kind of frame for thinking about uh, displaced persons and refugees in particular. So I just offer a few of those um, now before we talk a little bit about Chris Davis. Um, first, uh, the idea of privileging sameness, right? So that sort of sameness um, trope in the neighborhood metaphor that comes through um, really sort of can cement the idea that sameness is a necessary precondition for humanitarian aid to refugees. Is it? Need it be? Right? How similar must we be uh, or be able to identify with someone in order to be able to help them, right? And so there are sometimes some drawbacks, right, to emphasizing sameness um, over difference. Also the emphasis on the economics, right? Um, the economic and labor value of refugees may work well here in this circumstance where there was actually a demand for workers, but it can also be a problematic when humanitarian needs and economic conditions don't align. Um, it can be harder to make the case um, that you know, one should be helped for their, um, uh, for their need as opposed to right, our economic need um, in terms of providing the aid. Right, so thinking a little bit about how that economic argument, right, centers um, and thinks and labels people as an, an economic commodity as opposed to um, as a person. And that's sort of one of the, the other sort of big implications that we have talked about with students extensively is the, what, the ways in which sometimes this rhetoric uh, could actually be dehumanizing, right? And actually um, in one newspaper article we, read um, uh, a person and a resettlement advocate actually noted that the language of displaced persons itself was kind of an impersonal and cold-blooded um, and it admonished people to remember that these people are individual human beings, right? So that even the need to sort of explain or remind people that what we're talking about are not, um, you know, uh, entities, but they are in fact human beings. Um, and we have to think about how to um, navigate integrating them into our communities in more complex ways. Um, discourses that ally differences can sometimes also prevent us from preparing for the challenges and needs of resettlement. So language and cultural differences can breed conflicts. 
Um, and they can also make that kind of connection and integration more difficult. And this discourse of, you know, they're, they're ready to go, they're ready to come and support us also neglected, right, issues of trauma related to, um, right, the violence and the dislocation um, that refugees and the relocation that refugees had to bear. So, but I do want to end on a happy note. So I also we'll share a little bit about, um, right, some of the favorable ways in which Gustavus was involved in resettlement um, over the years. Uh, so this is probably my favorite part of the presentation today for this audience. Um, so many of you uh, are, I'm sure, familiar with Edgar Carlson, who was a former president at Gustavus. And I believe uh, his daughter is here today, too. So I'm so pleased that she's able to join us. Um, so uh, uh, President Carlson was actually actively involved in uh, supporting and welcoming displaced persons to Gustavus. Um, this uh, particular slide actually shows a letter that he wrote in July of 1949 uh, to um, a local pastor here in Nicollet County, uh, informing him of a, a workshop for um, uh, pastors and a parish education workshop, specifically uh, a piece of it was specifically talk about displaced persons and encouraging people to learn about how they can sponsor um, and be involved, uh, right? So one quote from the letter, he says the general purpose of this program would be to let pastors and people in the churches, churches know how they can get displaced persons, convince them it's not too much trouble to try and give them firsthand acquaintance with some people who have already come. Um, so uh, President Carlson was uh, instrumental in sort of networking within the regional community, but also um, helped to bring displaced persons and sponsor them directly to Gustavus. Um, one of the first that we can see that uh, he helped uh, sponsor was Arturus Cavara, who was an operatic tenor, had previously performed at the Vienna Opera House, um, which those of you who maybe are fans of opera know that that's not small. Uh, that's not a small role <laughs> to have performed. Um, and you can actually hear, there are a couple of recordings from Kavara available on YouTube that you can pull up. Uh, so he came to Gustavus and taught uh, voice uh, at Gustavus. Um, and also the first opera at Gustavus um, was taught by uh, Arturus Kavara. Uh, Carlis uh, Kaufmanis also taught as a mathematician at Gustavus. And my understanding is he also taught uh, Russian. Uh, occasionally on the side, but he taught for a number of years um, at Gustavus and also helped to support bringing other um, uh, displaced persons to Gustavus and to the community, uh, including um, a well-known painter, Waldemar Gutmanis, and um, Gardner, and we believe also a baker, and there may have been at least one other. Um, we're still trying to find out some of this information, some of which is um, being researched by Eileen Holtz, who's also here today, uh, looking at um, some artists uh, from Nicollet County and that, that history. Um, Gutmanis was a painter when he came over to Gustavus, when, when he came over uh, or when he was applying to come over, he apparently listed on his um, application that he was a grounds crew painter to try to increase the chance that he would find employment even though he is um, a, a canvas painter, someone who would paint like landscape. Um, and uh, so when he came over, he initially was painting walls and buildings uh, until it was uh, learned that he had the capacity to also teach painting at Gustavus. Um, and he also worked with Kavara on uh, set design, et cetera, for um, the opera. So, uh, so a number of um, folks were involved. There's also, uh, thank you to um, Joanna Swanson, Joanna Carlson Swanson, who's here today. Uh, this is a painting of um, the living room of um, Ebba and Art Edgar Carlson's uh, place here in St. Peter. And on the wall behind them is a painting of Old Main uh, that was done by Voltmanis, uh, Voldemar's Gutmanis. Uh, and as a thank you to uh, Carlson for his support. Um, and so that painting, uh, from my understanding, did for a long time um, hang on a wall here at Gustavus. Uh, it seems as though during a period of disruption called a tornado, it may have ended up in a closet and is, um, we do know where it is, um, but it is in some disrepair and uh, does need to have some treatment. Um, but it's a nice sort of um, additional sort of piece of our history. 
uh, hanging here or potentially hanging here at, on our walls. And a, a final sort of Gustavus connection that I just wanted to mention before I wrap up, because I'd love to hear um, questions and, and commentary from you all. Um, when I opened, when we opened the exhibit in the fall, um, at that time, um, uh, a gentleman from who lives in Pennsylvania reached out and saw an ad for the exhibit and said, oh, I have been looking for my family. Uh, I came to the United States and specifically to St. Peter when he was four years old um, as displaced persons and they lived on a, a farm outside of um, in St. Peter. And uh, he also said, we were not able to track down uh, the particular family that he resettled with, but he had kept the trunk that his family brought um, all of his possessions with um, over to the United States, which was stamped with the Gustavus uh, logo and label because uh, it was shipped or sort of journeyed over here, care of Gutmanis, um, so that um, he graciously donated the trunk to the Nicollet County Historical Society, so it's part of the exhibit right now. But another kind of connection um, to Gustavus Pass that I thought was um, an important thing to share. So. Um, with that, I do want to open it up and I'll, I'll close the slideshow. There are so many other um, connections and stories that have come from the exhibit, but I wanted to um, just make a special thanks to, I mentioned there are a lot of people who've been involved uh, in this project from start to finish, and these are um, a handful of names, and I fear I have probably left many others off. Um, but I also want to thank, of course, the Nicolette County Historical Society for the exhibit. So with that, I would